It's a pleasure to be with you all. I hope someday soon that we can be together with each other in person. For now, we have the vagaries of Zoom to entertain us. Let me begin with an example of what I mean by the tyranny of experts. In the district of Mubende in the country of Uganda in the year 2010, the World Bank did a project, a forestry project, which was supposed to increase the productivity of the land compared to the subsistence crops that were being grown there then. How was this project implemented? Well, it's a little surprising. The World Bank project consisted of armed, armed men showing up in Mubende to confront the farmers who had been living on this land for generations. The soldiers burned the farmers' houses, torched their crops, shot their livestock, and marched the farmers away at gunpoint from their own lands. This is a really incredible example of the violation of economic, political, and human rights. It was so egregious that it did get some publicity. Uh, a year later, eventually, after the story came out, it was published on the front page of the New York Times. So this one was one rights violation that got a lot of publicity. When it came out in September 2011, I was doing a blog called Aid Watch with Laura Fresky, and we immediately wrote about this story. And the World Bank actually saw our, saw our blog post, and they tweeted back to us saying, "We are." T let me read you the tweet in September of 2011. We are taking the allegations seriously and we are looking into it. Our focus is on improving people's lives in Uganda and elsewhere in Africa. And we thought, great, the World Bank is promising, promising us to investigate its own conduct and what happened in this rights violation. This was too good to be true. So just out of our excitement, we actually started a clock ticking on our website for the Aid Watch. Uh, to record the amount of time that would pass before the World Bank kept its promise and did an investigation into its own conduct in this rights violation of poor peasants in Uganda. Well, how long did the clock tick until there was an investigation? Any guesses? Well, I have to hear the report. The clock is still ticking today, 10 years later. The World Bank never did conduct an investigation into its own conduct in a project which resulted in violence against the rights of the poor. Now, this is an extreme example. I'm not saying this is typical of aid projects, but Human Rights Watch later documented how actually pervasive the World Bank's violations of human rights were in projects in, in, under, in unfree societies that the World Bank was supporting, unfree regimes the World Bank was supporting with aid loans. And a group of investigative journalists later found that the, specifically the phenomenon of resettlement, forced resettlement of people against their will in the, in the context of pursuing development projects was also pervasive in World Bank projects. So some of the people in Mubende, Uganda that were afflicted with a World Bank project may have wanted to say to the World Bank, why didn't you just leave us alone? <laughs> Couldn't you have just left us alone? Uh, that would have been a development improvement if the World Bank had just left them alone. So the phrase leave us alone in French translates as laissez-faire. Laissez-faire is one of the most radical and unpopular ideas in the history of economics. It's the idea that if you leave people alone, they will find a way to achieve their, their own goals and meet their own needs in free markets. This is the idea that was introduced by Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations back in 1776. That a, a system, a market economy where people are left free to make their own choices, not being forced at gunpoint to make a choice they don't want as, in, as happened in Mubende, Uganda, that a market economy where people make their own choices would lead to much better outcomes than a system in which experts force on people the outcomes that the experts recommend. This is the tyranny of experts versus the freedom of laissez-faire. Now, this is laissez-faire is almost universally rejected in the development and aid world. 
the development policymakers like approaches like what were known as the Millennium Development Goals in the years 20 to 2015, and now have been reinvented as a sustainable development goals that are meant to reach goal targets by the year 2030. The, uh, the development goals just had very direct action that if, uh, if they're inefficient subsistence farms, development agencies re should replace them with more efficient cash crops or forestry. Uh, if there's hunger, send food. If there's health problems, send medicine. These, these all sound very good. They're very appealing and they've generated an enormous amount of support for the United Nations and for the World Bank. The problem is that the top-down planners simply don't have enough incentives, knowledge, or control to reach the intended outcomes. And in fact, the Millennium Development Goals for Africa were not met. There are most, most or all of the goals failed for Africa, despite a lot of foreign aid to support the goals. In contrast to the failure of aid planning is the successful anarchy of markets and trade. So economic freedom of choice and trade is so central to development because it finds both the top income er earning opportunities for poor people and also finds the cheapest prices for essential goods for those same poor people. So the anarchy of trade is, can be illustrated with just kind of some amazing and surprising specializations that countries wind up doing when they participate in international trade. So some authors and I, a while ago, we calculated how much trade was flowing in all directions by very specific product categories and by both the, the, the country where the products come from and the country where the products are shipped, the origin and the destination. And we found that countries specialize remarkably narrowly on a specialization that involves both a very narrow product and usually just one or a very few small number of destinations where they send the products. So they specialize both by product and by destination. So some of these bizarre specializations is that Egypt gets a lot of its export revenue from exporting ceramic toilets to Italians. Kenya gets a lot of revenue from sending cut flowers to the Netherlands, while Ecuador gets a lot of revenue by sending cut flowers to Russia. So there's something so surprising about this that kind of illustrates how global trade is, is indeed an anarchy with nobody in charge, no designer, no planner deciding who does what. It'd be very hard to imagine a planner deciding Egyptians should do the toilets for the Italians while the Ecuadorians do the flowers for the Russians. Uh, Ugandans are part of this phenomenon also. Ugandans outside of Mubende that are lucky enough not to be afflicted with World Bank projects have made a lot of revenue for themselves to fight poverty by growing coffee of extremely high quality for American consumers, which you can verify by just going into a coffee shop, your local coffee shop and looking for Ugandan coffee or Rwandan coffee or Burundian coffee or Kenyan coffee or Ethiopian coffee, selling for very high prices in the rich countries and thus earning a lot of revenue for poor peasants to alleviate their own poverty. So when things go wrong in, in aid, it's often because there's coercion involved, which is the, one of the main themes I want to give you for the tyranny of experts. So for example, another phenomenon of aid gone, gone awry is when food aid gets sent into a very violent environment where there's a lot of unfreedom and political violence. So one study found that food aid on average actually increases violence in the country to which it arrives. And the reason this happens is when you send aid into a, a country like Somalia or Afghanistan, where there's a war going on, the violent actors, the violent actors will often capture the food aids. Somali warlords or the Taliban in Afghanistan are in fact capturing some of the food aid and then using it to pay their soldiers and to sustain and finance the insurgency, creating more violence. So another principle is that it's really a bad idea to send aid into a violent and unfree society. Is the aid business listening to this sensible advice? No, they're actually going in the wrong direction. Since 2001, aid has increased 300% to the world's least free and most violent countries, while all the other aid recipients only had aid increases of 35%. 300% increase for violent tyrants, 35% for everybody else. 
So it's oftentimes violence and aid is more, is more uh, subtle than that. Another kind of violence is economic controls on poor peasants, such as price controls. So for example, in Ghana in the late 1970s and early 1980s, cocoa producers in the Ashanti region of Ghana were forced by the government to turn over their cocoa to the government. They were only legally allowed to sell the cocoa to the government and to nobody else at a very punitive price that was only 6% of the world price. And to enforce that policy, the government had to deploy a lot of violence and declare the death penalty for smugglers who tried to evade those controls. The result of this was that Ghana, who at one point had had most of the world cocoa market, by 1983 had been reduced to having only a small, tiny share of the world cocoa market. The government had successfully killed off cocoa and destroyed Ghana's economic development process, prospects. So what does it mean to say uh, laissez-faire is better than coercion for development? Is this just kind of a, a hopeless, helpless passiveness? The, uh, these examples are actually suggestive of ways in which development experts can actually have a much more positive and constructive participation in development in the world, not at all the passive spectators of just letting things happen. Uh, we can advocate economic reforms that will improve these outcomes that will remove the extreme violence and extreme state controls that's what actually happened in Ghana. So after the early 1980s, led by Ghanaian reformers themselves, not actually even uh, having that big of a role for foreign experts, Ghanaian people themselves reformed their economy, removed the extreme controls on cocoa. Cocoa rebounded, the Ghanaian economy rebounded, and also Ghana became more free politically as there was a reaction against the kind of state violence that had declared the death penalty for smugglers. Ghana became a democracy as of the year 2000, and since then has sustained repeated competitive fair elections with no violence and no problems. Uh, these economic reforms have been widespread in Latin America and Africa and have resulted in a big increases in growth after the, a period of very poor economic growth in Africa and Latin America. So how is all this happening that uh, homegrown reformers themselves in the poor countries are achieving the kind of reforms that allow them to participate in the benefits of globalization, when in fact there is so much of a backlash against globalization in the rich countries and by development experts, and when in fact, when in fact the the development experts themselves don't seem to care about the rights of the poor, how is this progress on freedom possible when development experts don't seem to care about the progress of the poor? Well, there is one group that you can count on to care about the rights of the poor, and that is poor people themselves. They care about their own rights. And that's what happened when there was home, homegrown economic reforms as in Ghana and many other African and Latin American countries. So after all that, uh, in fact, there has been a, a wave of protests around the world against the remaining controls of undemocratic and authoritative authoritarian leaders around the world. Uh, one index of popular protests in Africa find over 90 popular protests in 40 countries during the 2005-2014 period. And a, a more recent report shows that political protests around the world are at their highest level that they have been in, in the whole history of an index of popular protests that goes back to 1900. So there is indeed a huge phenomenon of poor people fighting for their own rights and the least we can do as, as rich country development experts and observers and advocates is just be on their side and not on the side of the tyrants, not on the side of the tyranny. That's what we can do as development advocates. And that's what I hope all of you will show an interest in embracing that there is indeed hope for the spread of freedom so that development of the people for the people and by the people does not perish from the earth. Thank you very much. <laughs>